Well, hello everybody. This is Dr. Murray from Murray Natural Health and Chiropractic in Hastings, Nebraska. I was just doing another video on COVID-19. I'm titling this 2 Timothy 1-7, COVID-19 Part 3, Viral Testing and Optimal Health. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Hopefully these um, little short videos I'm doing, and there's a couple of the others that are on our Facebook page, as well as our YouTube channel as well, Hopefully that these are a message first of empowerment and uh, understanding, perhaps bringing some calm and some peace um, surrounding the, the whole infection and COVID-19 issue that's, that's uh, embraced our, our country and has encourages you towards health and wellness. Um, that whole message of for God has not given us a spirit of fear. There's so many things that we can do to protect our bodies, to get our bodies healthier so they can heal and repair. And hopefully part of this message uh, helps to promote that with you and your loved ones. So today we're gonna to talk about viral testing and optimal health. A lot of people ask, you know, how is this test actually done, the COVID-19 test? And there's two basic ways, and it's a PCR test. Basically there's a swab that's used, and the swab is actually used towards the back of the nasopharynx, it's inserted back into the nose, back towards the back of the uh, throat, basically, through the nose. And the little swab is rotated a few times, pulled back out, is put into a collection container that has some, uh, a medium in it that kind of protects the virus that you're actually collecting, you send in the lab. Uh, there's also an oral collection and it's kind of about a clinical decision as to which one is done, but both can be done. And again, you take the Q-tip in this case, the swab, place that in the viral packet, the medium, send that off the lab, and the lab tests it. So the, the nasopharyngeal swab is not the most comfortable thing to have done. It's not overly painful, but it is uncomfortable. It's just really irritating. But uh, still, it's not too horrible of a process to get done. That's sent out usually anywhere from four to five days. Results come back. Um, the problem with this particular test, and that's what they're finding, even in China and other places, that it has been anywhere from 70 to 80% sensitive. Now, the test itself is actually really sensitive. It's really sensitive for the detection of the protein or the virus that's, that's present. The unfortunate thing is that depending on what stage of where you are in the infection, you might shed virus at different levels. And then also the transportation of this virus to the lab and how many days it's in transit, that uh, protein that's there might actually degrade. And so there's some problems with that. And that's why I use a, a container that has a medium in it that helps to protect that uh, virus while it's in transport. Around 70 to 80% of it being sensitive, that means that there could be 20%, maybe even more, where there are false negatives, where a person might test negative, but it's not really negative. You know, we might actually be positive. So there's a problem with that, which comes out with the second form of testing that isn't really readily available right now, probably will be in the near future, which is serum testing or antibody testing. Now, antibody testing looks at your immune system and sees how your immune system is reacting to a particular bug. So there's two main antibodies I'm gonna talk about right now, which are IgG and IgM antibodies. So when your body encounters a, a infectious organism, first your IgM antibodies will elevate first during the acute phase, and then it will then, uh, your IgGs will elevate afterwards, your IgMs will come down, and your IgG antibodies will elevate and remain elevated past the time of acute infection. So the good thing about antibody testing in particular, that can, it can kind of tell you whether or not you're having an infection, active infection right now, that is your IgMs will be high, but it'll also tell you whether or not you've had an infection in the past, which would be your IgGs, and also how susceptible you might be towards infection in the future. And so if you actually look at the testing that's available now, um, and the testing over here with the PCA or the viral testing done through the swab, that's a, for a short period of time is where you're going to be able to detect the actual virus and where you enter in here will determine maybe how effective that particular test is or how sensitive that test is. Your IgMs will elevate and this comes up in your blood. This is your humoral response or your body's response, your body actually creating an immune system response to kill and take care of this 
this infective agent, and then your IgGs will elevate soon after and will re remain elevated. And this is the one right here that is proposed is gonna be a great thing for uh, just a, a response to coronavirus as a whole for our society, because it'll be able to tell us how many people have been asymptomatic, they report being asymptomatic, but then they have blood testing done and they see that they actually had it. They had this bug to begin with and they weren't even symptomatic. And why is that important? Well, they're finding that there's a large percentage of people who are actually actually spreading the virus and they're completely asymptomatic. So that's, it's gonna be a, a big game changer uh, when, that, uh, when we actually get that testing. That's just one vial of blood. Uh, this is, we're in our lab here, but one vial of blood Right now, that test is not available for uh, COVID-19, uh, but it will be, I'm sure, relatively soon. Just an example of that, I had a patient came in, they were tired, wore out, uh, just wiped out. And so we did some testing. I looked to see maybe that they had uh, West Nile and their IgG was elevated, but their IgM was not. And the IgM, remember, is the one that's normally elevated with acute infections, and it wasn't. So then we did Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus was elevated. The IgM and the IgG were both elevated. So the IgM told us they were having an acute Epstein-Barr mono infection. And uh, you know, so what was the treatment for them? Well, the treatment for mono is basically, from a, a traditional medical standpoint, is just resting, just resting. Resting, fluids, all those things, and you manage the symptoms. That sounds very much like COVID-19. Because COVID-19, there's really no active treatment for it right now. It's just managing the symptoms. And of course, if it gets uh, bad enough, uh, then there's all kinds of, of um, emergency uh, measures that need to be taken with respirators and all, all kinds of things. So, but it's interesting though. We're told by the CDC, and please do maintain and, and do what the recommendations are with regard to hygiene, with regards to washing your hands. I mean, why shouldn't we be washing our hands? The distancing, all those things, do those things, do those things, do those, th the, those things. But why aren't we focusing on the preventative aspects, the preventative things that actually prevent and help our bodies so we're not um, immune compromised to begin with? Okay, because if you look at the National Institutes of Health, the National Institutes of Health, their recommendations or their definition rather as what immunocompromised people are, those would be people that, are, that uh, potentially are, um, have cancer, are taking cancer medications, uh, those are people who are taking a, a variety of other medications. For instance, um, your uh, steroids can affect your immune system quite readily, and we know that. But also diabetics, those people have nutritional deficiencies. Those folks are the ones that are immune compromised. Why aren't we focusing on those things? You know, from the 1850s to the early 1900s, one of the major, two major things that affected and decreased the amount of infectious disease in our country from the 1850s to early 1900s was what? It was hygiene and nutrition. Hygiene and nutrition. You know, we got our feces and our waste and all that stuff out of our cities, and we did a whole lot better job of hygiene, and we also took care of our, we had a whole lot better nutrition as time went along as a developed country. Why don't we focus on, yes, the hygiene, and CDC has already told us a lot of things to do with that, and please do those things, but why don't we also focus on the other factors that I just talked about. The National Institutes of Health even recognizes some of those things, which is our definition of immune compromise. So why wouldn't we? And obviously we should. Prevention. I've talked before, and you should look at our other um, presentations, other short things we've done on uh, COVID-19 already in part one and two. Uh, but so when I talk about sleep, we know it and its effect on the immune system. Blood sugar and diabetes, we've talked about that, and that's part of the National Institutes of Health there actual definition. Uh, new studies coming out on hypertension because COVID-19 actually does have apparently kind of a predilection towards uh, cardiovascular conditions. And so hypertension is an interesting one too. Uh, but we know that diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, a large percentage of these conditions are preventable. According to the CDC, these are preventable. Not all of them, but a good percentage of them are. 90% of diabetes type 2 can be prevented. The CDC has also said there are 200,000 cases of heart disease, of heart disease deaths can be prevented each year. So that's important. Obesity. New study came out here recently looking at the UK and COVID-19 showing that two-thirds of the critically ill with this, with this condition there, two-thirds were obese. Why would that affect a person, how they come through this respiratory um, disorder, th this disease. 
Well, when you have too much weight, it creates a restrictive condition. In other words, your lungs can't expand properly. And if your lungs can't expand properly because of weight or because of other things, then that doesn't enable your lungs to actually expel and get rid of things how they should. And so you're gonna be more predisposed towards having respiratory infections and respiratory dysfunction. And so when we do uh, pulmonary function testing in our office for our DOT exams or for our other nutrition patients, et cetera, and uh, we can see whether a person has an obstructive or restrictive condition based off that lung function test, and you're at increased risk of respiratory disorders if you have a restrictive, which might come from obesity and other things, or an obstructive, which might come from smoking, COPD, and those things, from either one of those conditions. So obesity is related to it. Can we work on obesity in this country? Yes. Around 60% of our country is obese or overweight. Why wouldn't we work on those things? We should, and it has an effect on these, these types of infections. We need to be doing these things. How about vitamin D? The former CDC chief, Dr. Tom Frieden, uh, came out here just recently, just recently, and said that vitamin D helps do decrease respiratory infections. It helps to reduce cytokine production. Cytokine production is actually the bad guy that's been shown to cause it, basically the inflammation of lung and cause the scarring and cause the injury within the lungs. And this particular infection for COVID-19 has a, a rule that increases cytokine um, uh, production in the lungs. And so vitamin D, according to Dr. Friedman, also helps to reduce cytokine production. Also, it helps to limit other uh, types of infections such as influenza and those things, vitamin D. So this is uh, Dr. Friedman, former chief, CDC chief saying this. Exercise, I've mentioned this before, multiple studies out there showing that exercise helps to increase, uh, just to improve your immune system. We're just talking about wellness here, just talking about improving your overall immune system status, not about treating a condition, but if your body is healthier just in general, doesn't that mean that you're just going to be able to handle lots of different problems? I mean, if you exercise more and you lose weight and it helps diabetes, wouldn't that also then affect your possible outcomes with COVID-19 or anything else, of course. And that's the point here is that our bodies are designed to heal and repair and self-regulate. There are things that you, your family can do right now. This is the time for you to start focusing on your own health, your family's health, your kids' health, and, and you know, really integrating this into your new lifestyle for your family. God has not given us a spirit of fear. There are things you can do, start working on them today. You can test for these things on vitamin D deficiencies. That's what we do in our office. We do a lot of nutritional testing so we can get the body healthier, so we can find why the body is, is weak or not working the way it should, so it can heal and repair and self-regulate like it's designed. If we can help you out with anything, please don't hesitate to give our office a call. Marine Natural Health and Chiropractic, setting the standard in natural health care.